Bonju Habari Saleo. My name is Daniel Adeni, a professional officer at Ekle Africa. My name is Sinetem Bamtetwa, an intern at Ekle Africa. My name is Paul Curry, manager of the Urban Systems Unit at Ekle Africa. On behalf of Ekle Africa, the African Centre for Cities, Our Future Cities and Partners, I'm excited to welcome all of you to the Rise Africa 2021 Action Festival. Rise Africa has been growing as a platform of thinkers, doers and enablers, committed to inspiring action for sustainable cities. Rise Africa is about building active networks across academia, government, private sector, civil society and the arts. Our entry point is not based on articulating problems followed by proposing solutions, but rather on celebrating our cities as places of innovation and culture, while asking what more can we do to make them sustainable, inclusive and vibrant. This festival is hosting 46 sessions from across 16 countries in Africa and the world. Every session aims to share new ideas, showcase ongoing actions and launch new initiatives by bringing participants together to chart a new route forward. We hope that the festival program will inspire you to commit to one of more specific actions that you or your organization will take on. As this session closes, you will be redirected to a survey in which you can articulate these actions. We will follow up on these committed actions throughout the year and offer resources, connections and support. In this way, we are testing the idea that events can galvanize actions and we hope that you will join us in this effort. Beyond the session, there are many ways to take part in the festival. Register for further sessions. Vote for your favorite in the photo competition. Watch a variety of inspiring video provocations. Test your knowledge of African cities from our daily quiz. And listen and dance to the Rise Africa 2021 playlist. We hope that you will make all the attempts to reach out to new people and build long lasting connections. Before we begin, it is important to note that this session is being recorded and that by participating, you are consenting to be recorded. All the recordings will be available on the program page after the festival. And may I say that creative expression is vital for creating new features for our cities. So we invite you to enter this session in the spirit of creativity and dreaming. Thank you very much. To my future children, I bequeath this continent. Borders lowered and turned into a soft pile of dust smooth sand under steady feet your birthright is a country of flowers a city that holds you even with your complicated lineage the way this city has held my heart held its arms out for all of the lost people who found solace in it your halo is this land and all its wormholes portals hidden in plain sight between city skyscrapers where people from here resemble people from far away places and differences are muted while life happens i reimagine you a country that does not cage its doves a bequest of waters that pull precious histories mountains that stand guard to protect against the unknown a nation who preserves compassion over everything else a mouth that can home many languages and a spirit that rises above its fears. Um, hello everyone. Happy Africa Day and thanks for joining this session. Thanks for joining Rise Africa Festival and this session host organization Such Africa how arts, music, architecture, food, and language can drive Africa's inclusive urbanization. So how can cultural aesthetics like art, language, and food be infused into modernity in a way that can not only shape our cultural values as societies that continue to evolve, but integrate inclusive growth in our cities? That is what our discussion today would explore. There'll be lots of discussions today around cultural identity and why it matters today more than ever. So the essence of this session is to take us back to our roots, to when our cultures were very intrinsically connected to us and were very distinct to certain people, regions and territories. 
and to examine how these beautiful cultural values have evolved over time, leading us to this moment where we are experiencing an exponential growth in urban development with so many other underlying factors like the decline of many ethnicities or ethnic groups, loss of indigenous languages as a result of migration, and one of the most important critical factors, which is marginalization of indigenous people whose lands are taken away for this so-called urban development. With us today are revered African artists, photographers, architects, people that worked extensively to advocate for a more inclusive growth as Africa and Africans continue to change and adopt new social norms and cultures. Omar Began, he is a Somali architect, founder and principal of Dio Architecture and Design, an architectural firm based in Mogadishu. Umar specializes in sustainability, emergency architecture, and post-conflict reconstruction. He will go in depth on the topic of cultural identity and architecture in Africa to examine how these factors can influence urban cities and urban development going forward. Umar, if you would please like to come forward. Thank you. All right. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be part of what I like to call a movement. Um, so I will start to show my screen on the presentation so we can, I can go straight to it. Uh, I hope that everything is okay. The, you all can see the screen. Um, Cultural identity and architecture in Africa. So, I I picked this title, and I think it's um, it's quite important in that sense, um, because we live. I mean, they say that eighty percent of our lives we spend within the buildings. Within the buildings, we live, we go to work, sometimes we go to exercise, we go to play. So, buildings they have an important role in shaping our our daily lives. And, uh, and how they interconnect with cultural identity, I think that is, um, it's very important, especially when we discuss about the case of, of Africa. So what is African architecture? I mean, most of the, most of the time we hear about uh, you know, African architecture, African uh, uh, design, African fabrics, African food, but, uh, um, I think that all of this, it brings uh, a kind of a misconception of what the continent is. And, uh, and I think that it's important to, to remember that uh, we're talking about one continent, which is the biggest one on earth, uh, one of the richest in diversity, languages and, uh, and, and cultural behavior. So I always, um, I find always very quite cringe when we're talking about uh, African architecture. And I want to just like uh, um, drop what, uh, what I like to call a, a, a provocation in that sense and say that African architecture doesn't exist. And, uh, and, and I'm sure that um, all of you that are now are watching this presentation will probably get uh, uh, quite intrigued, if not maybe annoyed about uh, what I'm saying. But um, I think that we need to, to have a sort of consideration of and taking into consideration the whole world and figure it out one thing that I believe is very, very important. You never ever heard about a uh, European architecture or American architecture or Asian architecture. They're always uh, divided within, uh, you know, nations because that's how it is. I mean, if you're taking under consideration the uh, European environment, for example, right? And it's very, very, very small uh, continent, no? And you have, uh, you, you have very huge differentiation between, I don't know, Greece and, and Germany or Portugal and, uh, and Holland. And, uh, and, and I think that is quite interesting that uh, when, uh, when we talk about Africa, we always tend to generalize and take, or at least uh, people tend to generalize when, when, when they discuss about different different things about a, a continent that is very diverse. And, um, and this is like a, something we're gonna go 
uh, back at the end of this uh, this presentation. But this provocation is what it draws me um, to do a bit of, a bit of deeper analysis about what what is African uh, architecture. So here's the thing, and um, I think this is the most important thing to to take under consideration, which is that the cultural diversity is extremely important. So cultural diversity, it, it is what it makes, uh, uh, you know, uh, the world a unique place to, to live. It what it makes people, you know, different, what it makes like interesting to travel, it what it makes interesting to listen to the music. So, um, and these are the common heritage that I think we should work all to preserve for, for for the kids, for our grandkids, for who's gonna come after us. Because I mean, I think that uh, today with the globalization, we, we kind of assist of a uh, fluttering of things. Uh, nobody like, uh, you know, how you um, how you live your life or which, which is your work, you know, we live in a, in a moment uh, where we, we can, uh, you know, uh, having a Zoom call now, I'm in Mogadishu, someone of you may be in the States, someone in Nigeria, someone in South Africa, we communicate, everything is fast, everything is quick, you can access to all the information that you need, and we kind of are like, uh, you know, uh, it's become kind of like easy for you to buy, I don't know, clothes from, from, from the West and, uh, and, and having, you know, delivered to your house, and this is like, uh, um, I think that is a beautiful thing, but it's also like a dangerous thing in a sense, because I think that cultural identity is extremely important. But what is cultural identity? What is this diversity that I'm talking about? Well, this diversity talking about, it goes through many different things. And, uh, and I believe that clothes are one of the, of the main thing when we're talking about Africa and the colors and the cultures. And, and, and I think that this is, a, this is clear. You know, uh, we can observe that uh, this Africa, uh, African thing in reality is very, is very diverse. The, the design of the fabric is diverse. The, the way that the people wear the clothes is diverse. And uh, um, the meaning of the clothes is extremely diverse from region to region within the, the same nation. There are like differentiation in that thing. And this is one of those unique things that they make a uh, cultural identity. But um, together with the, with the clothes, we have, we have the food. And, uh, and shout out to my Somali food in this case, but um, food is another thing that is really, really important for the cultural diversity. Uh, Somali food is very different from the Senegalese food. That is uh, very different from the food in Morocco. And I think that this is very, very important because we, we tend to, you know, we live in cities where, um, you can kind of go, you know, on, on the mall or in a shop and having like, a, a, I don't know, Japanese food or uh, Italian food or uh, having Mexican food. And we kind of like uh, uh, forgot the beauty of this diversity. You know, we need to consider that before, not even a long time ago. Um, you know, if you wanted uh, uh, Senegalese food, you had to travel to Senegal. And uh, same thing for, uh, for the Japanese food, right? So, um, in, in the time where everything is accessible to us, uh, we should not forget the importance of that and how much uh, clothes, as, uh, as I mentioned before, but also the food, they gave us the um, a story. They tell us a story. The food is an extremely, uh, you know, incredible tool of, uh, of, of, of tells a story of the past, of telling like, uh, you know, culture through flavors through the smell, through like the colors. And, uh, and it's the same thing when we're talking about music. And, uh, and I think that, um, you know, uh, music is uh, absolutely one of the most uh, uh, diverse and, and, and important tools to describe the cultural identity because you also come from a language and language is another of those, uh, those tools. And, and let's forget for a second about the fact that uh, all the process of colonization that it kind of are trying to flattering all the, uh, you know, a whole continent uh, and, and give them, you know, certain national language rather than another. But, you know, luckily all the, um, the native languages, the dialects, they are like extremely important because they tell us a story, they tell us a story of population. And um, the music is exactly like that. The instruments, they change. The, the way of, uh, of singing is different. Uh, the role in, in, in the song is different, right? And, uh, and I think that there are like a certain things that are beautiful that is happening. I mean, if you're thinking about like, uh, uh, you know, 
Afrobeat in a, in a sense is change to give an example and it kind of like a bring on a contemporary way uh, um, you know the, the the African or certain African region uh, uh, vibe in that sense and um, and of course uh, architecture so architecture it plays uh, an important role in in shaping the way of living as I mentioned before but also in uh, how cultural identity is important for uh, uh, for for our daily life, and uh, and it is within the vernacular architecture that there is that uh, that knowledge. For too long, I believe um, we we lived in the narrative where verna vernacular architecture and uh, was something to, to to feel ashamed of, something that it was representing according to the West. Um, you know the non-civilization community you know the community that are not civilized around the world and this is like the uh the worst thing ever and it was an extremely strong tool of the colonial powers to uh to do that so as, as we can see and uh, and uh, I mean, this one is in libya for example and if uh, some of you is a, is a fan of star wars uh, can find uh, this architecture uh so the unicity of, of, of all of this from, from clothing that you, to food to reaching the vernacular architecture is what is shaped the, um, the, cultural, the cultural identity. But what is happening today? So wh where and how are we shaping the, the development of our cities around Africa and how much we take under consideration um, the cultural identity? So I think that uh, it's important for me to do just uh, uh, a step outside uh, our beautiful continent and, uh, and move a second to, to some European cities. And, um, and this is Holland, this is Amsterdam, right? And you can clearly um, figure it out how that is Holland. I mean, most of you know it's like uh, uh, Amsterdam and the houses and, and, and so on. And it is very unique. There is a very traditional way of building it uh, that is related to the way of living, to the climatic issues that they have and so on. And, and the history, obviously. And uh, in and, and Holland, you can uh, clearly see that it's uh, very different from, uh, from Rome, where the stratification and the historical background have been uh, kept carefully during the centuries. And if you compare Rome with, uh, with Lisbon, it's a completely different thing. But why am I, why am I showing you in, a, in an African conference and uh, European cities? Because they, they actually mark one very, very important point. It's because the European, what they managed to do was to keep and translate and use their own cultural heritage and history background to change the cities and then um, make, make them create a sort of a profit or tourism or other sort of, uh, um, of sources of income. But in, in, in Africa, they put us, put the African cities in a conditions to do exactly the opposite. In a situation where if we go a second back in the slide and we look at a vernacular, vernacular architecture, uh, we, aim, we usually tend to think that um, there is nothing good in this, that uh, you know there is something uh, kind of to hide from, from, from the history and not to be proud of. But what the European, they did exactly the opposite. So they moved from their vernacular architecture during the centuries and they elevated them until modern city where this kind of situation, they lived together. But when you move back then to Africa, it's, it is kind of different and uh, and, uh, and I don't know who can tell me which one of these cities are, where there are these two cities. Because something happened and, and, and something happened in the main city, despite the destruction and, uh, and, uh, and you know, the colonial powers that they, uh, they planned and they changed the city um, during the, uh, the sort of independence era of, uh, of, of Africa, the different nations they create an, an, an architectural architecture that will celebrate the independence and from the colonial powers all over Africa. But what is happening today with the development of our cities, it sees something 
that uh, in most parts of the world they are trying to avoid. Uh, it is something that uh, Europe doesn't do. And then uh, in, uh, in Africa, you see, for example, destroying the heritage, destroying the old buildings, do speculation, getting close to the sea and building and, uh, you know, reduce the public spaces. So our cities are simply because we didn't manage to, uh, um, to develop them in a, in a right way. And rather than uh, um, learn from the mistakes of the West and translate them in something, in something positive for our, our own outcome. So trying to avoid certain things, we're trying to copy what is happening on the West in a bad way. And then uh, we find out that we have cities that they don't fit our own environment because uh, living in, uh, in Dakar, in Senegal is very different than living in Kinshasa. That is different from living in uh, Djibouti. And if we design the same buildings, if we shape our cities in the same way, independently from the geographical area, from the climatic area, from the way of living of the people, then something is happening. Something is happening like in this city. And by the way, this one is Lagos and this one is Kinshasa. But uh, uh, what, what is happening is that the cities, they become overpopulated. And why do cities become overpopulated? Because there is no decentralization. There is no, and I they take under consideration what is happening in the rural areas. Uh, there is no development, architectural development related to um, the study of the vernacular architecture. Because look, and now, and now we're gonna go back then to, to, to that point, right? So if we're looking at these buildings, and then and these glass buildings, they're very, very different from uh, what is happening, for example, in, in the vernacular architecture before. There was a very deep study indirectly of the materials that are used because going local was indirectly the, the best way to reduce the climatic problems, to uh, you know, face the climate, uh, climate change challenges. And all of this, it is in our heritage. The knowledge is in our heritage. But what we're doing, we look for to this, and we're trying to translate in and in, in move into Africa. And then what is happening? Because the European development of, of, of the city doesn't fit with Africa. It is a completely different thing. And, uh, and I think that is like uh, uh, very important. And this is why when, when I say that uh, um, African architecture doesn't exist, I'm referring to the fact that in Africa, uh, we have 54 nations, nation with languages, cultural identity, ethnicity, heritage, a way of living. Africa is diverse. You never heard talking about uh, European architecture because it's different. You never hear like American architecture because it's different too. So this kind of generalization of uh, taking under one umbrella, uh, the whole Africa, it kind of like uh, play against us in that sense too. And uh, uh, to, to get out to, to a conclusion, because uh, my time I believe is almost finished, is Africa today in, uh, in, our, in our development and, uh, and, and, and sadly I have to say that as, a, um, as an architect, we consider this one of this picture as a, the, uh, the face of development. And we see this, as the face of uh, undeveloped past. And I think that this is completely wrong. It couldn't be wronger than this because this is what it is under development. This is what it is under development in Africa. And in the vernacular architecture where there is the knowledge because from a climatic point of view, for example, this building, it doesn't work in Africa. In this equatorial area, it's gonna be hot. You need air conditioning system. So you're gonna spend more electricity. You're, gonna, um, you're not gonna fight the climate change. You're actually gonna increase the problem. While our vernacular architecture is already started to face all these uh, challenges and the heat and, uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, you're not suffering. And uh, this one is in Cameroon. Uh, I lived and work in Douala and it's absolutely a super hot city. And why? They cut the trees and now you have buildings like this. And then you need to put on your air conditioning and you didn't use local materials because uh, us as architects sometimes are not able to translate the ancient knowledge, even in the small simple things into architecture. Um, 
but then how do how do we uh, and i want to conclude with this how can we uh, translate this vernacular architecture into a you know, contemporary building and uh, and, and why we're going to do that um I just going to I'm going to use what my my own personal example in this sense and this was an experiment that I did in here in Somalia which uh, actually using the culture was important especially coming out from an internal conflict and uh, and the civilization that uh you know involved the nation for more than 30 years so what I did it was like trying to study the um, the traditional fabrics and work with the fabric on an interior design and uh, and we kind of transformed these colors, this fabric into an interior, simple interior design. And this was a cafe. But this is just like a drop in the ocean of uh, of what uh, uh, you know you can do with architecture. So in conclusion, I'm going back to what I what I shared before, and uh, and 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 saying once again, the cultural like cultural diversity it is important for us, and it's something that we should all be proud. Uh, and, and, and in this sense, we're used as African, as a, as a continent, we should be proud. And in the small realities, even more, when we're talking about your own, uh, I'm not talking about your own nation, but even your own city, your own village, your region, there is something beautiful within that. It must be preserved. And we kind of like start to be more proud, taking ownership of what is happening in Africa and, and do not let the West taking the control of the African narrative, because this is the most important thing. So be proud, stay awake, and thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you so much, Omar, for, for joining us. Very interesting inputs that you have out there. I think that you made a very good comprehensive overview of African diversity by wrapping up the linkages between food, clothing, and music, expressing how each culture is distinct from one another as some of the basic factors that shape cultural identities. I think that's very interesting because I think from you know an outsider perspective, people just look at us Africans and think we're all the same because we're, we're black, you know, but us as Africans, when we look at ourselves, we look at our physique, you know, the tone of our voices, the shape of our eyes and nose, the, the, the way our hair grows, because all that define, you know, who you are and which culture or ethnicity you come from. So, and with what you have outlined in your presentation, I would just like to ask you uh, one thing, why do you think that we are yet to, or too slow at integrating our local architectural designs into our cities? Why is it that the idea of modernizing local African designs is still sort of in the abstract? Well, because the control is still in the hands of the West, in a sense. So uh, for example, yeah, uh, yeah, just from a sharing point of view, the yeah. biggest magazine of architecture and design, they're not African. In Africa, there is not an international magazine of architecture and design where a designer that can be, you know, they can use as a point of reference. Um, faculties of architecture and design, they're very young within the whole continent. Uh, if we exclude certain realities and uh, um, like uh, Egypt, uh, Morocco and, and Algeria and Tunisia, we have like, uh, a uh, few, few hotspot in, in, in Africa of architecture, but generally speaking, no. The whole continent, the project, most of the projects that are in the hands of non-Africans. And, mm. uh, and I think that all the biggest one, and all of this, I believe it create the sort of difficulties, right? And I think in the last few years, this thing change a bit. And the way to do that, I think is, uh, uh, you know, connect activity, like events like this one are very, are very, very good, you know, to, and they work as a wake up call uh, in that sense. I think just to ask what you, you say, I don't know about the architecture and design sector, but I mean, here in Nigeria, most capital projects in terms of, you know, most infrastructural capital projects are given to foreigners and these do not necessarily have to be Westerners. I mean, most of, most of the people here are 
from the Middle East, you know, people from Libya, people from just other countries. So I think there is also that, you know, sense of coloniality that many of our government officials that in we, many of these people feel inferior. So whenever something is foreign, they really feel that it is better. So most of the capital projects go to them. And these are people that would also use their own intuition, their own uh, background to shape these projects for us. So I think there is also that problem a uh, lack of diversity or inclusivity of local stakeholders or local talents. So um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for that insightful comment. So moving on to our next speaker, he is a visual artist that uses visual language to explore the culture of prosperity which reference to socioeconomic aspects. His works engage with Eastern culture featuring a matrix of historical gender and artistic status symbol. He expresses a masculine aesthetic outcry reflecting the culture of overconsumption and representing images that emphasize the perpetual dichotomy between hard labor and abundance. Please join me in welcoming E.L. Asselin, who will be speaking on the evolution of cultural identities and how that can shape our cities. E.L., if you can please come on board. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. First of all, happy Africa Day. And uh, Africa thank Day. you for having me. Omar, it was a wonderful presentation also. Um, so I'll start by talking about my uh, my art and uh, the theme that I, that me occupied in my identity for the last uh, few years because for a short time I will show you I'll share my screen right now wait a minute I'll share my screen and then all finally yes okay you will do that share screen okay cool main screen sure okay everyone can see my screen okay because of the short time, I haven't made a presentation, but I have uh, some of my works that are dealing with the identity. Um, I'll start with the first one, and I'll tell, give a little background about it. Uh, I am also have uh, North African roots. My parents came to Israel from Morocco at the 50s. And it's, I, don't, I think you can say that they brought all the traditional uh, habits uh, from Morocco and it's, uh, they're keeping on it until today. Even my girls have uh, uh, the, have the main of the tradition of uh, Morocco. Um, let me say it like that. Um, when I, when I uh, as a child, when I was uh, you know, visualizing or seeing my grandparents, I saw a very distinguished man, very distinguished lady with a lot of jewelry on them. Or a big chain of gold, like two kilos of gold. And my uh, my father's brother also was a pianist and uh, and also play on the oud. You know, it's like kind of a Moroccan guitar. And he was always going with the bracelets. It's called gourmet in Israel. A big, uh, massive bracelet uh, from gold. And my grandfather also, and my grandmother. And everybody thought on the street that. These people have uh, enough, uh, I think they uh, have the all good conditions to have a normal and good life. They, they look as a wealthy people, but uh, usually it was like a certificate of purity and also for richness, cultural richness and purity in life. Um, most of the people in Israel, when they came, when they, the arrivals from Morocco in the 50s came, uh, didn't know that, that they were hard workers and all of their, you know, uh, furniture, clothing and everything was stolen on the way or they uh, stayed back because they couldn't uh, get it or take it with them. And the only um, things that they could take with them was on their body, you know, the clothes and the jewelry. So when I uh, started doing my art uh, in my bachelor degree in the Chamel Academy, I started to deal with my, um, I think with my uh, identity as Oriental, as a Western, as a Moroccan, uh, but it was from the point of view of a victim, you know, for, of, uh, of a new arrival that uh, haven't been treated well and sent to working camps. If not, was a uh, working camps in Hebrew, it's called Mahabara. It's like 
new developing cities that came with, you know, with shacks from metal and, and wood. And people started to go to the long far uh, sides, sides of Israel and building the new settlements. So um, when I was using, you know, my, my West End, if you can say it like that, of me being a Moroccan, I have Moroccan roots, um, I started to deal with the victim point of view. And it got me to a crisis in the middle of my bachelor degree. And then I started to realize that the, the identity, the source of my identity is not the one that will determine the way I'm doing my art and the way that I'm choosing, choosing to live. So I had a break from painting. I was a painter and then I started sculpting. And the, my first sculpture you can see on the screen, it's called a pimp is the one that thinks you deserve a clap, uh, a mount of a clap. But um, it came from the, the origin, uh, the origin uh, term of pied noir in French. It's called the black fix. It, that's the way they was uh, calling uh, to the black workers in this. Not black people, but the black working men or the blue collar men in, in this at the 40s and 30s in French and in Israel, because uh, me uh, as a boy of a plumber that worked in plumbing since I was 11 until the, me, the middle of my uh, master's degree, uh, my first sculpture was my black hands, my two black hands. And there I'm dealing with my, uh, with my uh, working personality, the one that, you know, making efforts to, to have a living. And uh, I didn't know, actually I didn't know any other way to earn my money or to, to do a living without working hard. So that was my first sculpture. It's like a bicycle that uh, looks like a deer and they are, uh, when you're paddling, uh, you have two big blocks of styrofoam covering the tar that making like sounds of clapping, but it's not clapping, it's like more industrial area sound of a big machine that collides, collides with each other. And uh, that was my first option. Then I started to realize that um, that this is me. It's more a uh, new sculpture, but for the multi, and then we'll get to the others. I started to work on building a new identity because I believe that we are all 5,000 years old and only wearing a new pajamas all the time. It's quite fun to think about it, but we have a source. The only source that we know, the most of us know, it's uh, maybe if we're going back to the, with the religion or you know, to back the history, it's Adam and Eve, and afterwards it's Abraham, and he always didn't have uh, identity because he was a stranger in his country. So I started to build a new identity that's coming not from the victim point of view, but from the superstar point of view. And I started to deal with the blackness in me because of my uh, North African roots. And um, I started to treating new sculptures and also recreation of other sculptures in the history of art and to try to maintain a building of a new uh, identity or adding the layers because I think our identities are multiple layers and they keep adding all the time. And um, this sculpture, for example, is called Moti. It's based on a recreation of a sculpture of a hunter that's called Nemrod, that's done by Israeli Isaac Danzinger artist. And uh, he learned, he went to school in uh, Britain. And over there, he fell in love with Egyptian uh, culture and Egyptian uh, sculpture. So um, when I'm taking this Egyptian sculpture from done by an Israeli artist and then taking off from the white one to make one a black one instead of a bird, a hunting bird, you know, on his uh, shoulder, we have uh, a static symbol as, you know, the sphinx cat, the bold cat, but uh, most of the people that can uh, afford their, this kind of cat are wealthy people or uh, well uh, living people because it costs a lot of money and it's not a cat from the street. And uh, I took it as a pride to take, you know, uh, not, uh, not that, but, uh, but to create a new identity with pride that had a status, a new status, contemporary status, but also that sucks from or take or relation or have a relations with uh, the origins. And I think our culture started in ancient Egypt 
the Western culture, but also the mid uh, Mediterranean uh, uh, culture also. And um, I think our roots from the Northern Africa area and also from the Africa continent, I think that's, all the, that's the whole deal where it starts. So we'll go to uh, earlier works that I'm dealing with my uh, with building identity. Most of us know with the Thousand and Nights uh, stories, yeah, tales about uh, Simba and Alibaba, you know, the sailors and, and the poor people that went out to the desert and uh, met, out, met out with or found um, a cave with gold, with a big treasure. And from, and the jump from a poor guy that going alone to the desert to a wealthy guy having a, having a palace and having a status uh, equal to a king. I think over there, that was the fascination of me of looking at my identity as a multiplier, multiple identity. And I have a lot of layers in it. So uh, this is me uh, rolling as a Sinbad. And I'm not black, but I think my roots uh, can give me enough blackness to do that. Um, we'll go back to another images. I'll jump from images in order to uh, try to establish it uh, a little bit more. Uh, a new piece. This is me as Cleopatra. I'm looking back a lot to the ancient, the ancient Egypt and the hieroglyphs and the stories and the way to tell the stories of identity, of uh, heritage, of history. And um, I'm finding myself fascinated by it. And uh, I started to relate it with the Egyptian cats, you know, the Egyptian mouth and the Sphinx cats and the cultural uh, uh, way of storytelling, you know, from, um, from Egypt. And I started to play a role, a new role, once as uh, the, the repropriation of a sculpture that dealing with this Egyptian sculpture. And one is me as Cleopatra, a sculpture called uh, Cleo. And instead of a hair, it's got a wig that made out of golden chains. It's not real gold, but it's a fake gold chain because I'm talking about multiply identities and layers that we can wear it and put it down all the time as, uh, as we as a pajamas of a 5,000 years old people. Um, let's go to another one. And then I'm taking, you know, the grave of the king, you know, in Egypt, uh, I, I started to have a big interest in cats where, for the last uh, five years. And when I realized when I'm starting to deal with cats and with the Egyptian culture, I found out that, um, uh, the cat was the avatar of the Bastard goddess that sent by the gods, by, the, by Ra, the, the god of the sun, to guard or to watch or to protect all the Egyptian pharaohs and kings. And in here we can see like, um, like a big table with 14 cats lying around like the crypt of the, of the king, like in the grave. But instead of the king, or instead of the sacrifice in, it, in, the, in the, between it, there is a coal, and he's saying instead of the whispering coal, you know, when it's on fire, there is patents of uh, pyramids and of uh, high patent uh, that's called alive. And we're talking about the absence of the king, and also and only the sky, the symbols that make this status to to appear, because they were regular people like us. They have only uh, uh, great fortune to have this wealth by a heritage or by the heaven from their own uh, families. And we can see here, uh, you can see on the uh, on the ribs, like the, you know, when you mark in a cow, you know, we have this uh, hot, uh, hot bar that, that can mark the cow that she belong to her or something like that. In here, I made these cats uh, like uh, the gold bars of the Federal Reserve. And these cats are uh, like a big gold bar. They have the writing fine gold 999.9 in it. So it's very pure gold. And it's talking about the wealthiness and the symbols or icons of status from the ancient times until the contemporary time. And while I'm uh, working on, uh, on the Egyptian, wait a minute. On the Egyptian uh, cultural uh, identities, I started to fall in love with hieroglyphs and to try to tell uh, the contemporary era story 
uh, through making hieroglyphs and like it's like a gibberish because it's not really telling uh, a, a story, but it's a mix up between the old stories to the contemporary stories. And we can see over here, you know, like pharaohs and Ramses and the one dollar bill sign, the I watch it all, and also the sign of the uh, the god Ra, the god sun. And down there, we can see, you know, like um, like a, a junkyard of Rolls Royce. Yeah, so it's a status symbol, very contemporary status symbol. And if we go back to to the Rolls Royce and to the uh, the status the symbol the the status symbols that we use on our daily life, especially in today uh, today time for the last decade, it became a uh, digital uh, decade and uh, networking, Facebook, Instagram, people wearing multiply uh, identities and layers. So we can see here one of the ancient you know symbols for uh, for the chosen people or for the holy matrimony. Uh, we can see the Ark of the Covenant, but it's wearing a custom or a pyjama, or pyjama, like I told about us, is, uh, people were pyjama wearers. Uh, pyjama of the Ark of the Covenant, uh, like a Rolls Royce with two hands, two hands, two fronts, that can no move anywhere because the tension between it only wants to tear it apart. And, uh, and the material and the spiritual um, um, light becoming a material and become the bars that we can take the Ark of the Covenant with us. But it's, it's like talking more about how can I uh, not holify, but uh, to intervert with the contemporary holiest symbol. So in here it chopped and it's very low, like a low, low car that coming from, you know, the uh, gangster uh, culture in the hip hop music or in the universal uh, thinking about status, symbol status uh, on, the, on the web and on Facebook. Now we'll go to another one. And then I'm coming back to the worker image. Okay. And it's now dealing with new machinery with the old tractors in the kibbutzes in Israel in the 60s and to and referring to building construction sites, construction sites in the, in the contemporary era. But now I'm trying to create a new identity from a machine and to create and to make it very, very temporary. It still, it still exists uh, uh, in a surprising way for the last seven years. I already done a world tour, but um, it's talking about the virus, yeah, the virus of virality. I'm not talking about virus as a, as a, as a disease, but also talking about virality in the contemporary era, in how we can ship icons, uh, goodies, and, uh, and, uh, and merchandise from one place to another only with the click of a button, the click of a button through the internet. And also how can we make to create a new reality or uh, we can say uh, imaginable reality in the world machine are rule and we are uh, the workers that provide them all the things that they need to, speak, to still exist. So the identity moving between the worker, the hardworking guy, the construction worker to a superstar maybe or, uh, or a rock star. So now we we'll go to another one. This will be, I think, the one that may can assign everything. This is a video of me um, that I done in 2014. Over there, you can see me like a dog on, on six, shouting on a Dodge Ram car. So the Dodge Ram, the, the, this big truck, symbolized the West, the, all the, the, the new trucks, the shiny trucks that you know that. It's like uh, having a very, very uh, high attitude. There's a big jewelry and a very uh, iconable, I think, uh, symbol to, to establish yourself as a, a, a white column instead of a blue column. And this is me in an old factory, deserted factory in the southern region of Israel, shouting on the track for five minutes. And it's like a battle doomed ahead when I'm trying to uh, maintain my territorial establishment in front of the truck that may be um, trying to take over my identity or take over my place or my territory. So the identity is very diverse with dealing with the, the 
the old time, the ancient times, and dealing with uh, my uh, my contemporary feeling as a as an artist. So we can see here also in the hieroglyphs that I done in uh, in a furniture gallery. It's became a big thing or a trend in a uh, few places that uh, commissioned me to do it. And um, it's still it's like a, a big blob of gibberish, but it's still telling a story while I implement uh, symbols from the contemporary era as you know little cars and uh, burger or sandwiches and and high symbols and patents and uh, and jewelries inside it and to try to build another layers of identity okay. um, and I think I'll finish with uh, with only one that may be talking about our new identity with the identity that uh, post corona post covid 19 so when it happened, I think it was the first time that I started to try to build a new identity according to the changing era with the COVID. So I show only one of it. So this is the one that related from the, to the Moroccan jewelries that my grandmother and my uh, grandfather came to them from Morocco. And I'm still using it until this day to try to build a new contemporary identity. So it's always laying on the Moroccan, North African roots, through Egypt, to Israel, and to the West, to the US, and, and anywhere else. But I, I think it's very diverse. Yeah. Um, that's, that's very interesting, Elias. I just wanted to ask, uh, given what you have presented, how do you think that your art reflects a modern society's do you think that it's something that is relatable to our societies and can be infused when strengthening local cultures? Because I can see here that you, you make, uh, it's so much a combination of uh, structures, objects, jewelries uh, put together to create an artwork. So do you think that is something that is relatable to modern societies and that can be infused in terms of talking about local cultures and how we can strengthen our cultural values in urban cities. Okay, um, I think I can answer your question by the way of thinking on identity as not depend on the place in which it occurred. Because as I said before, as a 5,000 Years, years old people that were in pajamas, we have in layers all the time. And I'm thinking about the, the post-colonialism in Israel, yeah? Between the European, uh, European arrival and between the North African arrival. Because the European arrival were the high society and uh, the North African arrival were the low society, the hard worker, the black, black people, black hand worker. And in Israel, it's still an issue. Nobody talks about it, but you still can feel it, you know, in jobs, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the entertainment. And um, I think what I established to doing here by building local identity, it's uh, to be proud of it. It's just to be proud of it and make all the youth and all the youngsters and all the people that think that they should be ashamed of their origins or maybe to hide it or conceal it while they're trying to wear a new form of contemporary, successful, successful uh, new person, then should wear it proud. Like my grandfather and my grandmother came with the jewelry that uh, iconized them as, uh, as uh, big figures in my, in, my, in my art and in my history. So I think contemporary time should be dealing with multiple, uh, with multiple fruits not with one truth because we haven't a lot of uh, I think channels yeah. of looking at each other. Yeah, um, um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, that was very uh, thought provoking areas. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have a couple of minutes to answer any questions that uh, participants may have. So if you have any questions, please drop it in the Q&A chat box and uh, they will be responded to. Uh, so far, there isn't any question.
time is in transit. I think, uh, considering we haven't gotten any question yet, to take this opportunity to set an open discussion about the implications of open development to indigenous communities. Uh, so please do send in your questions, wait for the next speaker to come up. So I'm just going to start with a few comments on what I think about it. So actually, I have never really given much thought to, you know, uh, the implications of open development because, I mean, we, we need great infrastructure. So definitely open the good structures in the cities. We need great hospitals, good schools. But the question of how or where this land are derived from really never really crossed my mind until a friend of mine told me about this community. So there is this community. It's more or less one of those uh, this place, when you see them, you would literally see things or see that there are these fish communities, community, but these people uh, do not really have any living structures. They do not really have any structures. They, this place is in the center of the Nigeria. possible that this kind of structure exists in the middle of an advanced city. So these people began to tell us that actually the whole of the community surrounding the area belonged to them. It was their initial home. But when government started with their capital project, that is with their urban development project, what they did was that they discarded them aside and they pushed them to the edge of the community. So they told us that for 40 years, they have been struggling with the government for reparation. What they need was just for the government to allocate a different location for them where they can be able to go there, build their homes and settle their families. And this community consists of almost 200 people. And these include men, women, and very lots of children. So uh, at that point, we felt this is really on hard for because these are so many crises surrounding urban development that we don't really get to see or witness or that people have very little interest in. So what we decided to do at that point was, was to create a small uh, documentary about this community, looking at it from the scope of this old woman who has been you know, struggling and moving from shelter to shelter for 40 years. So the film is not out yet, but we have a trailer that we, we filmed months ago, even before we started filming, because we needed to have a couple of clips uh, in order to sell the idea for us to get funded. So I'm just gonna play the short clip right now, uh, just so you get to see this community. Um, so I considered a few questions that have come in. So someone said that aimed at Omer, not necessarily a question, but to add, would you, would you say that in terms of design in context is so important? So while I try to play the video, I think, Omer, if you can come on board to answer this, or you just check the Q&A box, you will see the question. Yeah. Uh... Well, the context is a, it's an integral, it's like a, it comes together with all the things that I say. I mean, uh, you can't analyze uh, culture and, and you know, way of living without analyzing the context. So obviously, uh, that's also what it makes a, a huge diversification, right? Because the conditions, the environment, uh, you know, they can be like, uh, from, from simple things like uh, lack of infrastructure to political instability to many different other uh, issues that they, together they play they play an important role in uh, in you know shaping uh, the way of approaching to the design in certain environments so yeah for sure the context is is mandatory uh, then those depend like you know which kind of context you, you take into consideration but yeah like the book I noticed in your background design, like you uh, give a thank you very much. Um, all 
All right. So I, I don't know. My network connectivity is a bit slow. So I hope the video would, would play all right. Uh, okay. So I'm just going to try and, and play this. Please let me know when it starts playing. I hope you guys There was a problem with the internet connection over here. Yeah, I believe I believe so. I couldn't see the video. Can you? Could you? No, I couldn't see it. Was like uh, thank you. That's it. The icon in the internet. Yeah, that's okay. I think she has like um uh, some issue, but uh, meanwhile, if I can. So, uh yes. Yes, I think um, Omar, carry on. She's rejoining. Clearly, the internet connectivity ended. Yeah, okay. No, no problem. I was looking at the, the question. Oh, yeah, she's back. That's okay. Hi. Nazarene? I think uh, she has some internet problem. Internet issue because. Uh... Yeah, I believe so. It's held on nicely for the last one hour. Uh, uh, Nazreen, we can't hear you or see you, yeah? Nazreen, I think you have some uh, internet issue with that. No, yeah. I got it. Nazreen, it doesn't it doesn't work. Anyway, so while uh, while they fixing that, I'm gonna just like get into some of these uh, questions that I think there was someone was asking me. Uh, the book behind me. I need to be careful at this point about what I put behind my <laughs> my side. Um, but yeah, this book behind me, the one uh, design like you give a day, um, I think is a very very interesting. Uh, 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 book. It was done by by Architecture for Humanity when it still existed, and one of the founder Cameron Sinclair. And it was, I think, that the beginning of when uh, emergency architecture was born. I will say. So um, yeah, and I think it's very. I mean, the title. I think it should be like for everyone, whoever you do in life, from design to <laughs> art. You know, you should do things like like you give a name, not just to do that. But yeah. Uh, I don't know, Nazreen, I think uh, she disappeared. So, oh, that's so many questions. Uh, what should we do? Q&A chat. All right, so I'm taking, we're taking the, <laughs> with, with which, um, I'm gonna go, I'm just gonna keep going then to, answer to some of these questions that people was asking me. Uh, is vernacular architecture commonly used? 
So is vernacular architecture commonly used? Uh, no. um, I think the people in case of disasters, yeah, especially when you're talking about migrations and internal migration, internal displaced people, natural disaster or, or conflict, you can see that in, uh, in refugee camps, uh, they tend to use, especially in Africa, uh, to use their vernacular architecture to create shelters. And which actually mutate according to the things. I mean, I've seen, uh, I've worked in refugee camps and you, you see that uh, what the international organizations they provide, uh, then it, it changed during the time with the, with the communities they live within this emergency context. So I think that that is a, a yes and not at the same time because uh, the international organizations, and we go back to the same thing of cultural identity of people understanding the context. Um, they rarely involve in the designing of these sort of emergency shelters or, uh, you know, local uh, uh, experts, you know, even if they're from abroad, like in my case, I, Omar, I can grew I up, I was from For one moment. Thank you guys for having me. My, my time is off because I need to go to watch my little baby right now. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Omar, for a magnificent uh, presentation. It was very intriguing. And uh, thank you so much for your work. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank Amazing you. work. Bye. Nice to be in touch. Hey, take care. Uh, well, yeah, I'm gonna just keep going until someone is gonna stop me with this uh, uh, uh answering this question. No, um, there was sorry, I missed that. Please type the out the author, uh, the author is uh, i mean you can check architecture for marketing and this is line this one like you did it okay uh what else was the other question was out about i saw the book like this is them as an architect in the city, in a city that does a community of many diverse people, culture and different ways of living, how do you go about designing public buildings, something that is inclusive to all? I feel sometimes in those cases, we strip away specification and create something that is generalized. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Right? That is a very tricky one. Uh, Sometimes with the buildings, I mean, most of the time with buildings, we impose the people the way of living. We impose the, I think about like museums, right? Which is the, the, the easy example. When, when you go through the museums, um, you are forced to follow certain paths, to look in a certain arts, to, you know, experience the space in a certain way. And these things that are actually carefully designed. So it's not just random. Um, and it's the same thing with, the, with, the, with buildings, right? So I think when you have different ethnicity and communities, I mean, first thing that you should do is like generalization in a sense that figure it out which one is the kind of uh, spectrum that the people are living in. So if you have a very, very mixed uh, um, society, like you have uh, West Europeans, Asian, African, American, South American, and all together, then it's a, it's, um, it's complicated, but also because the users, they usually never like uh, uh, come before the building. So uh, to put together all the, the, um, the communities in place, what is important is the participatory planning. So working with the communities, trying to be involved in the process and you know, working in a, in a, in a way to, to be sure that everyone is represented and the voice is heard in that sense. Uh, I think I answered all the questions now. So um, think about social housing. Social housing is, is one of the things. Social housing, I believe that for example, social housing European way works better in, in Africa than the one in the West. Nazreen, welcome back. Uh, thank you, Omar. And I was the host for a bit, yeah? I took your place. I was the host now for a bit. <laughs> Please to continue. I'm just gonna sit by the side unless you do your thing. <laughs> no, I finished. I was just answering the uh, the questions. So yeah, please go on answering the question. I'll pick up when you're done. Let's say it again. I said go on with answering. Ah, the I finished. I finished. I think. Yeah, I finished. You stayed away so from me, so I had to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, have you guys, did you guys manage to watch the video? No. Okay, so I'm afraid of playing that video just in case my internet goes below the belt again. But essentially, this people's land were taken away for to build one of the most prestige community in the country. While they have, you know, no sense of identity, they have lost their, you know, source of livelihoods. They have no living structures, no buildings, you know, no source of clean water. They have no access to electricity. They literally live in permanent woodshed because they're afraid that the government would come and demolish wherever it is that they decide to build within the community they once call home. And I think for me, that is very, very pro problematic because that is where marginalization and displacement comes in. Here you have a full community that is thriving and then you just decide to point at this location to say, well, we want to build estates here or we want to turn this place into industrial region without providing the settlers you know, an alternative source of living. We are providing strong measures to ensure that these people are moved to a place that is safe and conducive for them to continue their ways of life. So I think these are also one of the conversations that we don't often hear because most of the times people don't really understand the implications of these things. And whereas, whereas people do understand, they feel like they are powerless or helpless or that, you know, they don't really know how to advocate against this or speak about uh, on it. So I would just like to ask uh, the panelists, what do you guys think in terms of the implement implications of this kind of development to local communities? And what do you think the government should do going forward to prevent more displacement? Because I would just like to add that in Nigeria, actually this set of displacement is one of the key reasons that, ha that has influenced insecurity and ethnic indifference in the country because most of the people that are being displaced are people from a specific ethnic group. And most of these people, when they leave, when they lose their livelihood as a result, they, they just turn into criminals. You know, they turn into bandits going on the highway, you know, uh, kidnapping people, robbing people because they don't really have anything else to do and they have they don't have anything else to lose. So uh, what is your take and what do you think you would propose the government should do going forward? Uh, oh, this is like um, one of those uh, crazy questions, right? I think that, I think that it's always an economical thing. It's always like uh, uh, every issue related to land and communities, it is, always mainly directed to, um, to money in that sense. But there is also an issue that is happening in Africa. I mean, Nigeria, it is clear this. You can see the main cities in Nigeria and it's happening in Somalia too, in, uh, in Kenya, in all the African cities that now they're facing a huge urbanization, a strong urbanization. What is happening is it, there is a strong migration from the countryside and the rural areas into the main cities. And those are economical migrants. So when what the government does is try to take ownership of the land but in reality in africa wherever you are there's no lack of land if you if we generalize a bit right there is um, there there is like a sort of system that rotate around the main cities so which means that the one of the main issues in africa i believe is the strong centralization of system so the way forward to uh, avoid these sort of problems with the rural communities, with the natives and so on, is the decentralization of the system from an infrastructural point of view, educational point of view, medical point of view, uh, factories point of view. Because look, if I'm living, if I'm in Europe, right? If I'm in Italy, right? As I, as I, as I was born and grew up, right? If I'm living 100 kilometers from the main city, I still have the, the services. I can go to primary school, secondary school, and hospital. But if I'm living now, I'm in Mogadishu, if I'm living 100 kilometers from Mogadishu, I'm dead if I have like a, a problem, a medical problem. If I'm living in other cities around Africa, I have a serious issue. So the decentralization, it allows the people to stay within their area, grow in technologically development, you know, put your roots in that place and not having the lack of, uh, of, uh, of services. 
And this is what we lack. This is what the government lack. The government, the always African governments, they always put the tension on the main cities and never on the decentralization of the system. And this, in the next 10 years, will make, I mean, Lagos, I never been to Lagos and I wanted to go, actually I was supposed to go this year before this COVID thing. But uh, according to what I know, like Lagos is not that livable of a city. If you are like a, a walking person, as much as uh, uh, Mortician, Nairobi, Kinshasa, and you name it. But, uh, and why is that? In the next 10 years, there will be terrible living in this, uh, in this city. So uh, I, I do agree. I think it's that, that falls into, you know, governance and urban development in general, because most of our cities are not planned sustainably. So I think that is where most of those issues come from. Um, so um, we still haven't heard from our last speaker, but I think uh, he might not be able to come up. So in the absence of any other questions, and being that we've had, we just had an impromptu open discussion that we did not plan to have. I think that while the spirit is still high, we should round this up. But yes, a, a question I think just come in. Someone, I think a comment, Sheena said, government needs to develop with the people and ensure that when housing is built, there is integrated housing, that is social housing, low income ratio within units being developed. This is the case with the city of Johannesburg integrated housing policy. The policy requires that developers ensure that a certain percentage of housing is for social housing. Otherwise, the development proposal is not approved. Yes, I would definitely send you a link to the video because I have it on YouTube. And let me know if you would like to watch the full film when the project is out. This would be the first film that I have written, uh, creatively produced and directed. So I'm extremely excited about that. Oh, but I also have other projects that I have helped produce. <laughs> I don't know why I just said that. But anyways, uh, thank you so much everyone for joining us today. A uh, special thanks to the panelists, Umar and Elias. I am very grateful and I feel like we've covered lots of provocative uh, conversation and topics on how to infuse cultural heritage that is art, music, language and food into our cities to build a more inclusive uh, society. Um, the recording of this session will be available to participants should you wish to view it afterwards uh if you uh, so um we would round up for now uh, thank you to everyone for joining us and for sticking with us throughout this process thank you very much and we would also like to uh, say that there are other very interesting sessions during this festival so please do check out the website and attend other programs thank you very much everyone and have a nice evening <laughs>